This is Unsung History, the podcast where we discuss people and events in American history that haven't always received a lot of attention. I'm your host, Kelly Therese Pollack. I'll start each episode with a brief introduction to the topic and then talk to someone who knows a lot more than I do. Be sure to subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app so you never miss an episode. And please, Tell your friends, family, neighbors, colleagues, maybe even strangers to listen to. This week, we're discussing the history of the Northern Cheyenne people. The earliest written record we have of the Cheyenne is from the 17th century, when they traveled from present-day Minnesota to a French fort in present-day Illinois to trade for guns. But of course, the Cheyenne had been around long before Europeans came to write of their encounters. According to their own history, the Cheyenne had previously lived in the Great Lakes region before another tribe drove them west to what is now Minnesota. In 1804, the Lewis and Clark expedition encountered a group of Cheyenne along the Missouri River in what is now eastern North Dakota. On July 6, 1825, the Cheyenne tribe signed a treaty with General Henry Atkinson and Major Benjamin O'Fallon, who were representing the United States government. In the treaty, one of several the U.S. government established with Native tribes that year, the United States and the Cheyenne people vowed friendship with each other. They followed that up with the first Treaty of Fort Laramie, which is also called the Horse Creek Treaty, in 1851, in which several Native tribes, including the Cheyenne, agreed to allow safe passage for travelers on the Oregon Trail in exchange for the establishment of Indian Territory in areas of what is now Montana, Wyoming, Colorado, and South Dakota. Within a few years, however, white settlers came in droves to the area to hunt for gold, driving the Cheyenne and Arapaho from their lands, with no effort on the part of the U.S. government to enforce the treaty. In 1861, a group of six Cheyenne leaders signed another treaty with the U.S. government, the Treaty of Fort Wise ceding much of the land they had been promised in the failed Treaty of Fort Laramie. Many of the Cheyenne people disavowed the treaty and refused to abide by it. Despite attempts at peace, tensions continued to rise, leading to violent conflicts between the Cheyenne and the U.S. Army. In 1864, Colonel John Chivington led nearly 700 men of the 3rd Colorado Cavalry in an attack on a camp of Southern Cheyenne and Arapahoes, killing 137 people, mostly Cheyenne, and many of them women and children, in what became known as the Sand Creek Massacre. In 1865, the U.S. government, acknowledging the violence of the Sand Creek Massacre, established a reservation for the Southern Cheyenne and Southern Arapaho in what is now Oklahoma and Kansas. The Northern Cheyenne, with their allies, continued to fight the U.S. Army until Red Cloud's War ended with the signing of the Second Treaty of Fort Laramie in 1868. The discovery of gold, this time in the Black Hills, again quickly threaten the peace. In 1873, a delegation of leaders from the Northern Cheyenne and Northern Arapaho tribes, including Cheyenne Sweet Medicine Chief Little Wolf, traveled to Washington, D.C. to meet with President Grant. They came to no lasting agreement in the meeting, and upon their return, the tribe fought off white encroachment on their land. 
the U.S. government had tried to convince the Lakota to sell their gold-rich land. When the Lakota rejected the offer, the U.S. government violated the 1868 Treaty of Laramie and issued an order that all Native people in the region needed to return to designated reservations by January 31st, or they would be deemed hostile. Groups of Lakota and Northern Cheyenne refused the order and banded together, with Lakota Sitting Bull leading them. In June of 1876, Lieutenant Colonel George Armstrong Custer led his 7th Cavalry in an attack on Sitting Bull's camp along the Little Bighorn River. Custer had greatly underestimated the size and armaments of the Lakota and Cheyenne forces. And within an hour, Sitting Bull, and as many as 3,000 warriors, had killed Custer and his men. While it was a decisive victory for the Lakota and Cheyenne, the result was increased efforts by the U.S. Army to force the tribes onto reservations. In fall 1876, Army troops were on the hunt for Crazy Horse, a war leader of the Oglala Lakota, who had been instrumental in the Battle of Little Bighorn. Brigadier General George Crook heard about a band of Cheyenne camped nearby, which included Little Wolf and Dull Knife. And Crook dispatched Colonel Ronald S. McKenzie and 1,100 men to find them, accompanied by a large contingent of Indian scouts from several different tribes, including from the Cheyenne. On November 25, 1876, at dawn, McKenzie attacked the Cheyenne village. Despite resistance from the men of the village, the troops destroyed 200 lodges, killing and wounding many, and driving the remaining survivors into the cold with few supplies. Many more Cheyenne froze to death in the following days. By the next April, with no hope of finding sufficient food, many of the Cheyenne who had been on the run since the attack surrendered at Camp Robinson in Nebraska, under the belief that they would be able to stay on the reservation in the north with the Sioux, in accordance with the treaty. Instead, nearly a thousand northern Cheyenne were exiled south to the southern Cheyenne Reservation. Facing terrible conditions in Oklahoma, two groups of the northern Cheyenne marched north again. Although they initially faced fierce resistance from the U.S. Army, an 1884 executive order finally established a 690-square-mile reservation for the Northern Cheyenne in present-day Montana. Today, the Northern Cheyenne tribe has over 12,000 enrolled members, of which just under half live on the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation in southeastern Montana. The Cheyenne language is considered endangered. Efforts are underway to preserve it, and students at Chief Dull Knife College on the Northern Cheyenne Indian Reservation can take courses in the Cheyenne language along with courses in Cheyenne beadwork. Joining me now to help us understand more about the history of the Northern Cheyenne is writer Jerry Robinson a member of the Northern Cheyenne Tribe and author of The Cheyenne Story, An Interpretation of Courage. Hi, Jerry. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thanks, Kelly. Wonderful to be here. Yes, I am really excited to have learned this history and to be talking to you about this. So I want to understand a little bit about how you came to write this book. This is, in some ways, your own family's history. Can you tell me a little bit about you know, the, the process of getting to writing this book? That's correct. Uh, it is 
based on the history of my tribe, the Northern Cheyenne people, and I was born and raised on our reservation in Montana, southeastern Montana. I'm an enrolled member. And like a lot of uh, young people who grow up, I wasn't too interested in history at first until I moved away from home and got a little homesick and looked back and and uh, wanted to reconnect. And I'd been told stories uh, since an early age uh, about our people's history. And of course, at uh, when, when I was younger, I, I had other interests, and history was for old people. And but once I moved away and got a little homesick and looked back and tro- wanted to reconnect, it just I just realized that what a what a a rich and impressive history it was uh, that I was connected to, and it's it's uh, very important to Cheyenne people to know how we're connected to the tribe what what family and and there was a time when the bands different bands were very important so that's essentially how i started was just finding my own lineage my own heritage and tracing that back and the first person that i i really connected with was actually a white man named uh bill roland who moved out west in the 1840s, and he married my great great grandmother, who is in the book. Sis Frog is her name, and then the the rest of us came after that. So Bill Rowland was essentially the thread, the the first thread that I found that I was able to weave into this story and my connection to him. And in the process of following his thread through the story. I found the rest of uh, the the details of the story. When I was younger, I heard some of the uh, more general parts of the story, or if it wasn't the general part of the story, if it was more specific, it was specific to a, a certain person or a certain perspective. And so following Bill Rowland through the story, I was able to find a, 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 a broader pattern in the story and a more detailed pattern in the story, a more cohesive pattern. And uh, once that started to appear, I, I knew that this was something I had to, uh, I had to write down. It has been written uh, about before, but never by a Northern Cheyenne. You decided to write this then as a, a novel and you, the, the book sort of goes between two different viewpoints. Could you talk a little bit about the your your choices when you're doing something that is, you know, it's it's historical fiction, it's based in real events, based on real people, but there's choices to make of course in terms of, you know, little things that might change here and there that that don't necessarily affect the overall story. So what what was your process in doing that? So I I write Bill Rowland in first person because I have a direct family tie to him. And from the Cheyenne perspective, you you really can't tell another person's or another family's story. With a story this large, with all the families involved, uh, you can you can tell it uh, from a historical perspective. But it's it's it wouldn't be right for me to take a first person uh, approach with Little Wolf, who is my other protagonist though I am related to him through marriage, but because I don't have the blood tie to him, I write him in third person. And when I introduce both characters, I try to introduce them at their the the point of their biggest dilemma in in this this history. And for Bill Rowland, it was that moment when he realized that he was going to be riding with the U.S. Army up into the mountains to attack the Northern Cheyenne, the main winter camp of the Northern Cheyenne. And for Little Wolf, it was that moment when he realized that 
that the soldiers were in the vicinity and there was a very good chance they could attack and it would be wise to move. But because of the Cheyenne social and political structure, there were impediments to that that he couldn't overcome. And so he was caught between necessity and tradition. So I, I want to pick up on this, the social and political structure of the, the Northern Cheyenne. It, it's really interesting, and you, you really draw this out in the book, that there isn't one leader, there isn't one person speaking for the group, or at times there are attempts by people to do that. Could you talk a little bit about that and you know how, how decision-making happened in, in this time period with this group? That's a, that's a great question, and I'm glad you asked that. Contrary to some people's beliefs, the Native American people were not uncivilized. They were not, they, they did not move in en masse uh, around the country. Their lifestyle, their culture, just their, their familial ties were much more complex and their, their society and their political leadership was much more complex than, than most people understand. The Northern Cheyenne tribe had for hundreds and hundreds of years lived under the uh, guidance of what we call the Council of 44. And it's a, it's a very well-balanced leadership structure that incorporates different representatives from, from different parts of the tribe and establishes different, if you will, offices, uh, much like the U.S. government does to manage the affairs of the tribe. And they, they provide this, this balance, this counterbalance, so that no one uh, part of the leadership structure has more power than any other part. And, they, and for anything to be decided, it takes deliberation, oftentimes long deliberation, and and discussion to to come to a decision, and that's uh, essentially what Little Wolf was up against at the beginning of the of the book. And in that case, a uh, a younger warrior society leader uh, uh, named Laspel basically declared martial law, which was his right as a society headman to to do. And in that case, the it, it, it's it's martial law. The the military takes over and they make the decisions because it's an emergency type situation. Uh, however, in this case, the reason that he declared it was just simply to hold the camp in their place uh, so that they couldn't move, and that's where all the problems began, at least on that night. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about language and the the Cheyenne language. So uh, that's a really important piece of this story. Bill Roland is an interpreter. And I what I found interesting, and your book really demonstrates this, is that even within the Northern Cheyenne people, they might not all speak exactly the same dialect of the language. And there, you know, there are neighboring tribes that might speak similar, but not the same language. So can you talk a little bit about that and the, the ways that language is so important then when they're trying to interact and communicate? So much of um, the, the language that is that I refer to in, in the book is the Plains Indian Sign Language. That takes a central role in, in not only Bill Rowland's relationship with, with Lieutenant William Philo Clark and and uh, the interactions that took place there, but it was the the common language used between tribes for trade and, and negotiations and and all of that for centuries. So that's really that is where uh, if if you want to relate uh, at that at that time at that point in, in history, if you wanted to have a conversation with someone from a tribe that you didn't know too well, that was the go-to language to use. It was general enough, it was broad enough that that you could have that discussion. 
but again, with the uh, with the um, uh, Northern Cheyenne language, I, I go back to the the comment I made about complexity. People don't understand that that uh, that you can have, it, and especially today, the the, the tribe is, is essentially split. It's two separate tribes: the Northern Cheyenne who live in Montana and the Southern Cheyenne who live in Oklahoma, and be, and they have been living separately since about 1830. And as a result of that, strong differences in the dialects have, have, have occurred. And the person that I used that was my go-to for the book was uh, Dr. Richard Littlebear, who was uh, at that time the president of Chief Dull Knife College in Lambda, Montana. And he's a linguist. He also has a friend, uh, Wayne Lehman, who was a big, big help with a lot of the uh, the grammatical spelling and all. And, and, and they are, I would say, they are the two best authorities on the Cheyenne language today. Even with that said, though, there are people who will disagree with how they pronounce words or how they spell words. And, and so even on the reservation, uh, just a 20-mile difference, 30-mile 30, 30 difference on the reservation uh, you might find someone who says a word just a little bit differently than than someone else. So it's a, there's a complexity there, and and it it occurs it n- not only in the sh- uh, Northern Cheyenne uh, culture; it it occurs worldwide. And again, just just a, a small bit of of um, complexity that 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 people aren't aware of from from the time I was a child and and used to watch. John Wayne movies and Cowboys and Indians on TV, even though I was, I was watching the, the, the show sitting in my living room on the reservation. My understanding was that all the Indians thought the same at the same time and spoke, you know, said exactly the same words and moved in all at once, you know. And, and it wasn't until I got to a, to, a, I guess, a better understanding, uh, an age of self awareness, I guess, where I realized wait a minute, something's wrong here. And you grew up with some familiarity with the language, but not as a a fluent speaker. Is that right? Correct. Uh, I'm the product of three generations of boarding schools, my grandmother, my mother, and myself. And at boarding schools, it was just impossible to speak your language to uh, until about, uh, until about the 70s, 1970 or so, changes slowly started to occur, and, and people realized that if we don't start to preserve the Cheyenne language, it would disappear. And and that's that's something really that this book is. Uh, I, that I feel this book plays a small part in is that is that that effort, that movement to reclaim language, culture, heritage, tradition. Just, uh, just to help so many of the younger generation don't know this history. They'll, they'll know as I did, maybe a name or two and something about being sent to Oklahoma and, and, and that's it. I can tell you that the, the part of the story, this is the, this book is the first volume in a, in a trilogy that I'm writing. I'm currently writing book two and, and trying to get that done. But, when I started writing this book, so much of this part of the Northern Cheyenne history was brand new to me. I did not know about this battle that took place in the Bighorn Mountains. And I, I would venture to say that that 75, if not 80 or 90 percent of the Northern Cheyenne people at that time, around 1990, 2000, did not know that, that uh, this fight took place at all. Or the role that it played in the the ending of the what what has been called the Great Sioux War or the Plains Indian War. What are the the kinds of sources that we have then? And I, I'm particularly interested in knowing. I'm sure that the U.S. military has a ton of their own sources, and the U.S. government has their own sources. You know, so what what are the sources we have from that perspective? But then, what what are the the Cheyenne sources that we have for this? Sure. As far as sources that I've used, I people often ask me what kind of research I've done, and my go-to for that is is it's button the chair, boots on the ground, rubber on the road research. 
the elders have have helped a lot in my understanding of history. They have their limitations. We are, in one way, we are we're at that point in time where these stories are starting to fade. I have talked to others of my generation from the reservation who realize we are a crucial generation because we have connections to those elders who are still with us. And it's imperative that we get from them what we can so that we can turn around and pass it on to the, to the, to the next generations. So we've been doing a lot of that. Uh, the book has opened some doors and I'm working on a, um, a couple different history projects for the tribe that has helped with the research for books two and three to to get more in depth with with some of the stories from the elders. So that's that's there. We're we're, we're gleaning what we can from them. The, the there are two problems with that. One is oral tradition is fragile over time. It breaks down. As much as I want to would like to tell you that I use the exact same words that I heard from those elders. I can't. And and as much as those elders want to say, they told me the story in the exact same way that their grandmother told them, they can't. Over time, we forget, we adapt and uh, change a word or two, and the story starts to take a little different angle. That said, I, I, I think that I, th I think that they're trustworthy. The, what, what I have to do, though, is to take that history and run it parallel with documented history. And, and this is where the boots on the ground come in with being out in the, on that site and seeing how that story fits into that site. And there have been times where both historical documents and oral tradition have uh, misremembered a site when I've got out onto it and looked and and uh, kind of compared notes and you know, but yeah, a tons of government documents. Uh, there are a lot of interviews that were done from back in the day. Uh, Mari Sandoz, who was a Swiss woman from um, Nebraska, who lived in the area of uh, Fort Robinson, did a lot of interviews and captured a lot of this history. Uh, George Bird Grinnell is another who was an anthropologist who was able to do interviews with the participants of all of these, all of these events. So, yeah. And then, and then it was with this particular book, there are a few recorded newspaper uh, documents about it. When I get into books two and three, there are a lot more recorded because they're they're down into ceded territory at that time where settlers are are setting up their homesteads and whatnot, and the journalists tend to hang where it's a little safer there and and write their stories. You were just talking about going out and looking at sites. Land is such an important piece of this story. It's really you know one of the characters in the story. Could you talk a little bit about that and the importance of you having grown up on this land and, and being able to go out and, and look at it to, to understand the story? Indeed. Thank you for recognizing land as a character. It's for the Cheyenne, it is it is our mother. And so yes, it is. It's 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 it's, it's what holds us and what we're connected to. So it 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 plays uh, a, a big, big role, and 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 I can say most certainly that that I have felt a much stronger connection myself as a result of my writing and the research and the work I've done and getting out into the hills and out on the prairie and and walking where my ancestors walked and and uh, being there with them and listening to the wind blowing through the trees and feeling the heat on my back and, and, uh, watching the water flow and, and, you know, seeing the, just the terrain they had to move through. And, um, it, it is, it's, it's, as the story goes on, I mean, they, 
my ancestors did not want to leave their home. That's, that's what it boils down to. And book one tells the story of, of how it came about that they had to, and it broke their hearts. Books two and books three will tell the story of, of that connection, hopefully in a way that, that takes that character, the land, and, and, and puts it front and center, uh, in, in really, uh, in, 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 in such a way that the reader will understand that just, just the love, the connection, you know, the, the necessity of being in their homeland and what they were willing to do to, to achieve that land is a relative. And just as important to to us as any of our relatives, and uh, to lose any of that land or relative is is heartbreaking. Yeah, and so so much of this story is really hard history. It's it's incredibly devastating what happens and uh, the the things that the Northern Cheyenne have to have to deal with, have to pick up and keep going and going and going. Could you talk a little bit about what it's like as a as a writer to be telling a story that is is so difficult, is so devastating like that? For me, knowing knowing the entirety of the story, this is really a story of of great victory, and it's a a, a story of that that just fills me with such pride. And I think every story that's worthy of being read will take the reader um, through these dark places. And it's it's how the protagonists or how the the I would say, well, they were winners in the end. How 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 those that you're you're rooting for go through those dark places and come out on the other side. And, 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 and how they find that victory and what that victory looks like. And I, I can tell you that there are many like me on the reservation who look back at this history and, and recognize, absolutely recognize all the pain and misery and heartache that our ancestors went through. What we realize is that they went through it for us so that we would have this homeland. They were thinking of us, and I, I tell that to people, and I, I, I say they, they didn't know me specifically, but they knew I was coming, <laughs> along with a lot of others, and they did this for us. They, they went through all of this for us, and so when we look back at this pain and struggle, and suffering, certainly our hearts go out to our ancestors for, for having to go through that. But speaking for myself, my heart fills with, with such pride to know that I'm connected to a group of people who were brave, who were resilient, who were determined, um, who, who gave everything they had so that they could come back to the place that they loved. And as we mentioned before, to their relative that they loved and meant so much to them so that their descendants could know that connection as well so to to sit down and, and write the dark spots as you say these this portion of the story is it's a struggle and there's more of it to come but that just for me what is the saying the stars would not be as bright were it not for the dark and and that's what uh that's what we're going through now are are the is the that period of darkness that they they had to go through it would have been nice if they didn't but because they went through it today the northern cheyenne people uh, have have their reservation albeit uh, a, a much smaller portion of land so i i think this is a really important story that that everyone should read can you tell listeners how they can get a copy of your book sure well the book is available uh, on Amazon. It is also available in bookshop. 
I often refer people who ask me that question to uh, go to, it's an online, if, if they're interested in supporting uh, an author, uh, a native author and a native business owner, uh, my brother owns a small Etsy store and the store is called Sage and Oats. And it's uh, an, just an Etsy, Etsy store, Sage and Oats. And uh, just scroll through. It's a, well, he's Northern Cheyenne as, as well as I, of course. His, his wife, Michelle, is a uh, Irish uh, descendant. And so, hence the Sage and Oats name. And uh, he, he sells it online there as well. But Amazon uh, would, be the, would, would be the most well-known place to find it i know you can also get it at barnes and nobles and, and uh you know it's not it's not really well distributed but but it's out there and people should of course also recommend that their libraries get a copy <laughs> absolutely absolutely and just to, to i guess toot my own horn a little bit it did win the 2019 uh, western heritage award for uh novel of the year which is, uh, and a couple others, but the Western Heritage Award was really the one that just was very notable to me when I saw the list of other people who have won that award. Uh, it kind of blew me away a little bit. Was there anything else that you wanted to make sure we talk about? I think that the book, as I said, it's a small part of a big effort that is ongoing to uh, remind the world that Native Americans are still here, that we haven't been lost to history, that our history is worth revisiting, especially now that we as Native Americans are gaining a platform to tell our own stories. And this is my effort to do that. Uh, there are many, many others out there who are doing the same thing and are just as worthy of, of being read and listened to. There's a truth about what happened. What I try to capture in my book is, is that truth, and it's, and it's a, a more balanced uh, perspective about what really went on. In the book, I mention a quote from the Lakota chief, Red Cloud, who was approached by a, uh, the commander of Fort Laramie uh, at one point when uh, the Red Cloud agency was on the Platte River. And there had been a, an altercation between uh, some Lakota and, and, and some soldiers. And the commanding officer came down to talk to Red Cloud, and he wanted the Lakota warriors to be to be reprimanded for their part in this altercation. And Red Cloud told the officer, there were fools on both sides of that. And that is, I think, the first balanced perspective that I ever read of what happened back in those times. There were fools on both sides. There were heroes on both sides. There were good people on both sides. Bad things happened. Bad things happened. Hard history was made. But the time has come that we look at that hard history from a, from a more realistic perspective in order to understand it better in hopes that we won't repeat a lot of those same mistakes as we move forward. And thank you for this opportunity to share that. Yeah. Thank you, Jerry, for telling your story and for speaking with me today. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thanks for listening to Unsung History. Please subscribe to Unsung History on your favorite podcasting app. You can find the sources used for this episode in a full episode transcript at unsunghistorypodcast.com. To the best of our knowledge, all audio and images used by Unsung History are in the public domain or are used with permission. You can find us on Twitter or Instagram at unsung underscore underscore history, 
or on Facebook at Unsung History Podcast. To contact us with questions, corrections, praise, or episode suggestions, please email kelly at unsunghistorypodcast.com. If you enjoyed this podcast, please rate, review, and tell everyone you know. Bye!